Good evening. And thank you so much, Carol, for reminding us tonight with that prelude how beautiful our Savior Jesus Christ is. He is lovely. He is fairer than 10,000. He is the lily of the valley, the bright morning star. He is the one who attracts our heart more than any other earthly desire. And when we stray away from his beauty and his loveliness, he calls us back with his grace and his mercy. It is wonderful to be in the house of God with you tonight as we gather in spirit and truth to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, to worship him together, and to hear a little bit more from that precious Psalm 23. Welcome to those of you who are members and guests, and I don't know if we're online tonight or not, but if you are, we welcome you as well. I'd like to call us to worship tonight from the 32nd Psalm, verses 8 through 11. This is a Psalm of David. It's one of forgiveness. It's one of repentance. And as we come to verses 8 through 11, the Lord now speaks to David following his repentance and says these words, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. This dovetails with our passage tonight. He leads me in paths of righteousness. The Lord goes on to say, Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. In other words, people of God, don't be stubborn before the Lord of heaven and earth. The, the Lord is calling on us. He's calling to us. And don't be like a stubborn horse or a stubborn mule. Don't ever say that to your spouses. But know that God can say it to you and me. And then, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And so here's this beautiful call to worship of those who've confessed their sins and have them covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. God is speaking and softening our hearts that we will not be stubborn. And he says the sorrows of the wicked are many, but his love surrounds his covenant people. So be glad and rejoice, O righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And that's what confession does for the soul. It, it leads us to praise and worship the Lord. And so I invite you tonight to stand if you are able, and we will sing hymn number 473, Victory in Jesus. We'll have an opening prayer, and then we'll continue with All the Way My Savior Leads Me.
Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that the overcomer, the victorious one, is not the one who lives the perfect life as if something like that were possible. The overcomer or victorious one is the person who knows Jesus Christ, who is washed in the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus, we have been worshiping you tonight already, speaking of your victory, singing of your victory over sin and death and hell and the grave for all who trust in you. But we thank you so much that your victory is our victory. Your resurrection is our resurrection. Your reign in heaven is our future reign with you in heaven. And we bow before you once again tonight on this second Sunday night together after nearly a year's absence of evening worship. Oh, how we thank you, God, that we can gather tonight. And we pray again as we do often that you would send your Holy Spirit to be with us and minister to us and assist us in our worship tonight. For the arm of flesh is weak and the intellect of men and women apart from God is foolish. But we come to you this hour fully dependent on you once again, not only for the air we breathe, but for the spiritual oxygen of your Holy Spirit, Jesus. So come be with us, encourage us, strengthen us. In your name we pray, now and forevermore, amen. And before we sing again, would you give a wave, a nod, a smile, or a hello to someone in your greeting time tonight? song I'd like to sing tonight is entitled In the Garden, uh, written by a, a gentleman called C. Austin Miles, lived in the late 1800s to mid-1900s, 
He was a pharmacist. So I don't know if Jim and Jamie want to do something different in their later life, but he's a pharmacist. There you go. And uh, it was written in a dark basement in New Jersey. Uh, no, not even a window. But he was reading in his Bible from John 20 about Mary Magdalene in the garden. And this song comes out of that. And I thought maybe it was a fitting thing for us to look at tonight when we look at uh, how our Lord speaks to us and deals with us. It says, I come to the garden alone. It talks about our individual and personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, the joy we share as we tarry there is like none other has ever known. And we all know that we each have that joy when we tarry with him, but it's each a personal and an individual thing. And so, uh, yeah, this time of year, there isn't too much dew on the roses either, but uh, we're just hopeful for spring that that will come. So listen to the words and let them speak to you and let the Lord speak to you. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear Falling on my ear The Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known Oh, I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Oh, the joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever known. Amen, and thank you so very much, Pastor Ken. We had an opportunity this past week to become acquainted 
and to start our relationship, and I look forward to many more times together. Amen. Shall we join our hearts together in prayer tonight? Our Heavenly Father, in the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to be born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. We, by nature, are under the curse of the law. We, by nature, are under the condemning influence of the law. And yet, by rebirth in Christ, by the Holy Spirit, we are set free from the law. We praise you, O oh God, that we, we love the law. We delight in your law in our innermost being. We don't want to have any other gods before you. We don't want to make an image of anything that is in the heavens above or on the earth beneath or in the seas under the earth. We don't want to take your name, Lord God, in vain. We want to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We want to honor our parents. We do not want to murder or commit adultery or to steal or to bear false witness against our neighbor or to covet anything that is our neighbor's. And oh, Jesus, as you summarize the law, we long to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength in our neighbor as ourself, but we can't. It is impossible for a human being to fulfill both the letter and the spirit of the law in the flesh. And that is why you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to fulfill all obedience to the divine law for 30 and 3 years. And we praise you tonight that you count to us the righteousness of Christ. And so now, we, we live out the law of God as a, a faithful pathway in this world. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we love your law. And like David, we meditate upon your law day and night, O oh God. And we thank you that you continue to instruct us in the way that we should go. As a congregation, we pray for those who wish they could be here tonight but are unable to for some reason. We pray for those who are convalescing, recovering, O oh God, from surgery or illness or something, O oh Father, that has stricken them and kept them away from church or kept them down. We think of Ken and Nancy Kleinhexel tonight, and we pray for them as tomorrow Nancy undergoes tests and how we pray that they will reveal the source of her back pain and a remedy as well. Care for them, O oh Lord. And care for others we do not know tonight who are struggling in, in mind and body and soul and spirit. We thank you, good shepherd, gentle shepherd. We thank you for being with us, O oh Lord. And we take heart in the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians. Blessed be the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our distress, so that we may comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Lord, we thank you for this Sunday night worship service. We thank you that you call us together in the name of Jesus to worship you. And we pray tonight that as we continue to worship you, our, our hearts would be strangely warmed as it was for the two disciples on the Emmaus Road with you on Resurrection Day, Jesus. You unfolded the Word of God, the Psalms, the Law and the Prophets, and they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he taught us the Scriptures? Jesus, would you be our true teacher tonight? May the Holy Spirit give light to our eyes, the eyes of our heart, that we might know you better. And in knowing you better, may we deepen our understanding of your atoning death and sacrifice, your glorious resurrection on the third day, your rising up from the tomb of death and despair, and the hope that you give all people who place their trust in you. 
We thank you, Jesus, as we will soon learn tonight that we are not alone, that you are with us. And as the old King James says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort us. Lord, comfort your people tonight. And Father, where we are straying from the paths of righteousness, may you call us back with your rod and your staff. Defend us from enemies. Discipline us and correct us when we wander and bring us back into your fold. And as you say in John 10, you will open the gate as the gate, as the door, and we will go out as your sheep and find pasture. We bless you. We love you. And as we heard in our prelude tonight, you are a beautiful Savior, more beautiful than anything we see, hear, or reflect upon. And we thank you that in creation we see but the outskirts of your ways, as Job says. And if all we see in creation is but the outskirts of your ways, how beautiful you must be in person. We thank you tonight for your presence, your love, your tender mercies, and how you carry us like a shepherd all day long. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. And if you are able, let's stand together and sing 462, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us. Wonderful singing tonight. Isn't it joyful to sing in the sanctuary on Sunday night again? Have you missed it? 
Yes, we've missed a lot, haven't we, over the last season? And the Lord understands that because the Lord is sovereign and He's over everything. And I, I found a, a quote by noted author C.S. Lewis. He once wrote this, Not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not so there's no God after all, but so this is what God's really like. Deceive yourself no longer. And, and, and one of the most important things for those of us who've, who've walked with Jesus Christ for a, a year or two is to realize we're not going to cease believing in God, but the real danger lies in believing the wrong things about God. And you and I live in an oceanic world right now that is very polluted with toxic thoughts about God. It's almost as though humans feel free to create their own versions of God, version one, version two, version three. And as Christians, we find our understanding of God in Scripture. This is where you know who God is, what God is like, what He expects, what He commands, how He Himself rejoices in His people. And so, what we are doing by going somewhat meticulously through this well-known Psalm 23 is simply aligning our thoughts with God. God says in Isaiah 45:19. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. And he's simply reminding the church that his word is truth, his word is right, and what you read in the Bible about God is what God wants you to know about God, <laughs> along with creation and conscience and how he's moved in the world across the centuries. And so tonight we come once again to such a beloved psalm, number 23. Someone said to me in the narthex before the service tonight, it's my favorite psalm. And I said, amen, it's, it's mine as well. And so it's, it's a precious psalm for many reasons. And tonight I'm, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, and we're going to look at the second part of verse 3. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Now our text for this evening. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. When I was a seminary student years ago and we started our preaching class, I thought to myself, how will I ever find enough material for one sermon, yet alone be a preacher someday? How wrong I was. My, my calling now is not so much to struggle with finding material. It's editing all that I have so that I don't preach two hours. I jest. I will not preach two hours. But this is powerful in a simple single verse like this. So pray with me and we will launch into this portion of God's Word tonight. Lord Jesus, on that Emmaus road, Luke tells us that you you instructed Cleopas and the unnamed partner in the law and the prophets and the Old Testament scriptures. And so tonight we just take a little, little snack of the Old Testament and we want to eat it spiritually 
We want to digest it spiritually, and we want it to truly transform our lives. That's why we're here, to worship you and be changed. In your name we pray, amen. Charles Spurgeon says this about Psalm 23. This is the pearl of psalms whose soft and pure radiance delights every eye. And indeed, this is a precious pearl. And like beautiful gems, it needs to be polished over and over in all of our lives. And how do we polish the scriptures so that they become closer and dearer to our hearts? By grace through faith, the same way we're saved. The way into salvation is the way into sanctification. By grace through faith we have been saved, and by grace through faith we continue to walk with Jesus Christ through this world. Tonight we come immediately to the third verse. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I want to take some time tonight and unfold this rich pearl of truth and wisdom for your hearts and souls. When you look at this portion of verse 3, you will notice right away that it's different than some other versions that use the word guides, but they're virtually synonymous. And so the translators of the ESV write, he leads me, whereas some use he guides me, in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And right away, the, the portal is open and we enter into the believer's journey through life. And so that's what this portion of Psalm 23 commends to our attention tonight. This is about your journey with Jesus in your single, solitary, earthly life you have. We do not believe in reincarnation, whereby we come back in some other life form that belongs to other patterns of belief and religions. We understand history as being not circular but linear. God had a beginning and God has an end that will transport all people into one of two destinies for all of eternity. We are seeing history unfold before our very eyes every minute, every moment of life. There's no going back as much as we want the good old days or the bygone years of yesterday. We are here and now. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. Yesterday is over. We have this moment to live for the Lord, and let us learn about our journey together from Psalm 23, verse 3. The first thought about this journey with you and Jesus Christ is this. Jesus Christ journeys with us as our shepherd. Look again at verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack anything I need. We looked at this extensively a couple of Sunday nights ago, but it begs reminding that we are to view our Lord Jesus Christ as a shepherd. There are so many ways you can view your relationship with Jesus Christ, and one of them is shepherd. And I would say that would be a dominant one for us as believers in Jesus Christ. Let's look at the first three words of verse 3b. The text says, he leads me. He leads me. If Christ leads us, he journeys with us. And if he journeys with us, we are never alone on our life's journey. One day, every married couple in this auditorium tonight will be a widow or a widower. If it hasn't happened yet, it will happen to all married couples unless, by God's providence, he calls both believing partners home at the same time. On this journey, it is so important to know that we are not alone. We can recite the first Heidelberg Catechism inside out in body and soul, Christ is with me. But it's important that when the rubber 
never hits the road of life's trials and disappointments that you know you are not alone. So with this before us now, he leads me on this journey through life. You'll notice, again, the very first word, he. When David penned these words, if you go back up to verse 1, you look at the word Lord. David is using the word Jehovah. Jehovah God, the great I am who appeared to Moses at the burning bush. That was David's concept. But we also know that David looked ahead to the coming of the greater David, the Messiah. And so we read Psalm 23 with New Testament eyes. And we say, yes, this was the Lord God, Jehovah God, of whom David wrote. But now in light of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection, Jesus is now our good shepherd. Jesus is now our faithful shepherd. In fact, you will find this so clearly in John 10 where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Peter, not to be outdone, he says in 1 Peter chapter 5 that Jesus is the chief shepherd. Good shepherd emphasizes that he is not a bad shepherd as others are. He is not a false shepherd. By saying, I am the good shepherd, Jesus is saying, I am opposite of all false shepherds who teach and lead you astray Follow my teaching. So he, for us as Christians, now means Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our good chief shepherd. And David writes that he is the one who leads me. What I want you to notice here is when we read he leads me or Christ our shepherd leads me, leads us, this is pointing you to the journey you are on with Jesus Christ. Whether you are single by choice or by providence, whether you are married, whether you are young or old, healthy or sick, you are on this journey with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what you discover as you age with Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ is not only on a journey with you, but you are on a journey with Jesus. Think through that with me for a moment. You may say, I know that Jesus is on a journey with me. But do you know that you're on a journey with Jesus Christ? And this means that in your prayers and conversations with the Lord, you can say things like this, Jesus as we take this step of faith together. Jesus, I'm wondering about this. What are your thoughts on this? Jesus, I am really confused right now. Do you have wisdom, insight, knowledge that I need before I say no or yes to this situation? You and Jesus are on this journey together. It's not one-sided. It's the two of you, as Jesus was walked with the disciples on the Emmaus Road. He's on a journey with all who believe in him, and all who believe in him are on a journey with Jesus. A couple of thoughts about this journey. It's, it's foundational for the Christian. You are on a journey with the risen Son of God. You are on a journey with the, the ruler of the kings of the earth, no matter whether those kings of the earth in our generation are ruthless and cruel or just and wise, Jesus is your true king in a world of multiple kings. Jesus is your true leader in a world of all sorts of leader. Jesus is your true economic resource in a world of all sorts of economic resource. Jesus is your true prince and true president in a world of all kinds of other princes and presidents. You view him as your king and your shepherd who is on this journey with you. And now in time, your one life that will only go so long until glory is your moment and opportunity to journey with Jesus. And so I say to you, dear Christian, tonight, 
that you are being led on your journey by Jesus Christ. And this means a few things. First of all, it means that your life is not aimless. Isn't this a wonderful thought? There are so many people around you every day in the blogosphere, Facebook, or Instagram, if you use those social media tools, or simply in your newspaper reading or taking in the nightly news. We are living more and more in a world of people who are aimless. They don't know where they are going. In fact, I try to make the case that even in America, this is a time in our Christian history where Christians and churches know less and less of what they believe compared to our ancestors. I, I've never seen the church in my lifetime and certainly I think in American history so confused about what we are to believe and who we are as Christian people. Jesus is the one you can say, he leads me. He leads me. My life is not aimless. I have a led life, a planned life. In fact, in Job 23, 14, Job cries out, for he will fulfill what he appoints for me. And many such things are in his mind. So if Jesus is leading you, follow him. You're wanting to live a led life. And he has plans for you. So follow him. Don't sit. Don't stop. Don't stall. But follow the one who says, follow me. Second of all, to know that you are on this, on this journey with Jesus. Jesus as your shepherd means that Christ is with you. Not only has he given you purpose in life and identity and definition, he's with you. We'll learn in a couple of weeks, his rod and staff, they, they comfort us. I believe this is one of the most comforting truths in life, don't you? Every funeral I officiate, every wedding I celebrate, every couple I counsel, Every sermon I preach, I try to find some place where we can speak of the comfort of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, because to know that he is with me is the greatest comfort in life. So often over the course of my ministry, I've had people in, in my various churches come up to me and say something like this, Mike or Pastor Mike, whatever they want to call me, I, I experience it. I, I know what you were preaching about now, and I'll say, time out. What do you mean? What do you mean? When I went through this experience recently, I actually experienced the peace of God which passes all understanding. I said, you did. Wonderful. I know what that's like now, they say. And that's Paul in Philippians chapter 4. The peace of Christ or the peace of God that passes all understanding is a supernatural endowment of the Holy Spirit of the risen Jesus in the human heart which enables us to cope with resources not our own in the midst of life's stressors, anxieties, and fears. Get to know him. Get to know him this shepherd who is your chief shepherd and your good shepherd. Thirdly, this means that your life is in his hands. I want you to know this tonight. When you read right there, he leads me, you can say, Lord, my life is in your hands. You hold me in the palm of your hands. In fact, he not only holds you in the palm of his hands, I'll up you one on that. In Isaiah 44, 16, God says, Behold, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. So not only are we held by God, but he has engraved your name on the palm of his hands, which is God's way of saying there's no deletion, there's no eraser, there's nothing that's going to take you out of the palm of my hands. Jesus says, doesn't he, at the end of John 10, the Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of the Father's hands. Verse 30 then says, I and the Father are one. So if no one can snatch you out of the hands of God the Father, then no one can snatch you out of the hands of God the Son. You are that secure in the shepherd's love. Fourthly, this means that Jesus Christ is taking you on the adventure of a lifetime. 
So enjoy it, dear Dutch Christians. There is room for joy in the Christian life. We are not those who want to look like we've been baptized in lemon juice. We have been redeemed by the grace of God. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength this night. Jesus says, I have come, John 10, 10, to give them life so that they have it abundantly. And you know what else this means as I conclude this first thought? This means something pretty profound. This means that your life or your journey with Jesus Christ is sacred. It's sacred. You are standing on holy ground in your walk with the Lord Jesus. You know, it's, it's so sacred that it's special. Sacred is a deeper word. Special is a lighter word. But what I'm trying to convey is that your relationship with Jesus is sacred and it's special in the sense that your journey with him, he leads me, he leads me, he leads me. Your journey with Jesus is one of a kind. There will never be in all of human history another journey with Jesus quite like yours. So we've been welcomed in the last week and a half, I think, with snow. I don't know if you prayed for snow as Pastor Mike and Gina arrive, but we have faced a lot of snow over the last while, just like you. And I started thinking this afternoon that every individual snowflake is unique. And so are you. And the path Jesus Christ has you on as boys and girls, as men and women, is very special. So let him lead you. And this leads us now to our second thought. If Jesus Christ journeys with us as our shepherd, this means he's leading us on our personal sacred and special journey in a very unique way, and it is this, number two. Jesus Christ leads every believer, notice this now, in paths of righteousness. We need to dwell upon this for a moment. Verse three says, he leads me, says David, in paths of righteousness. Everyone is on some sort of path tonight in this auditorium. Let me share some possible paths we may be on together. The family path. Young couple raising our kids. We may be on the single path. We may be on the new employment path. We're on perhaps a moral path or a relational path, an educational path, a, a happy path, a sad path, a sick path, a healthy path. You can't be human without being on some path. But the question is, which path will we be on? Here we're told about paths of righteousness. Are we on the path of life or the path of death? The path of faith or the path of sight? The path of love or the path of hatred? Both these paths are very much in our world today. I don't know if any of you like off-roading in trucks or pickups or revamped vehicles. I know that's a, that's a big deal for a lot of people. They like to go off-path, off-roading and see what their vehicles can do. And I advise against that as Christians, not, not the literal off-roading, but the path of righteousness. You don't want to go off-roading. You don't want to go off-path. When you do, praise God, he's there to forgive, but the heartache is sometimes very deep and very real. These paths of righteousness are paths that God led Adam and Eve on, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, the prophets. And the question I ask now is, so how does God lead us in paths of righteousness today? What does he do? Well, I'm thinking with you right now of that wonderful passage, Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, where he begins that book like this. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors in many ways and at various times, but in these last days, in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, by a son. 
And so as God led them in paths of righteousness in many ways at various times across that Old Testament history, in these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son. All the ways God revealed Himself in the Old Testament are now fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our path of righteousness. God's paths, biblical paths, clean paths, godly paths, paths of service, paths of love as we're going to do with our fruit baskets as a church later this week. How does He lead you? A couple of thoughts. Number one, He'll lead you by the Word of God. He'll lead you by the Scriptures. You'll open, you'll read, and if you're desperate enough, you'll fast a meal or two and you'll say, God, I need wisdom on this. Please speak to me from your word. He'll lead you by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will, will impress upon your heart and mind in conjunction or harmony with the word what God may want you to do. Godly counsel. How important is it for us to seek godly counsel from others? What about circumstances? God certainly uses circumstances. David says in Psalm 139, you hem me in behind and before. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. God will guide you through prayer as you pray to the Lord and uh, something of all of these was involved in our lives in the last several months as we discern God's path for us, His right path for us as a couple. Jesus Christ is leading you tonight in paths of righteousness. And I want to say two things about them now that I think are relevant for our day and age. Number one, here we go, they exist. They exist. Jesus' moral paths, his paths of righteousness, God's paths of righteousness, the Bible's paths of righteousness exist and they do not change. People sometimes wonder, well, why don't God's moral laws change? And it's, you have a very simple answer. Morality doesn't necessarily evolve. You know why? Because God is always God. The Ten Commandments are always the Ten Commandments because God is always God. We are to love God and our neighbor as ourself because of the character of God, the heart of God. God does not change. And when he etched in stone commandments, he etched them for human civilization for all time. And you will see some manner of adherence to all the laws of God in all cultures of all ages, albeit far below the calling of what the Bible teaches. These paths of righteousness exist. For instance, in Jeremiah 6.16, 6, we read, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. Do you hear that? Find rest for your souls? Jesus said that in, in Matthew 11. Come to me and you will find rest for your souls. He's playing off Jeremiah 6.16. 6, Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths. Grandparents, Remind your children and your grandchildren, we follow ancient paths, tried, proven, and true, revealed by the heart of God for the human race. God deals with the human race as lawgiver and judge. This is part and parcel of what it means to be a human being. It started with the covenant in the garden, and it continued with Noah and Abraham and David all the way down to Christ fulfilling the covenant. These are true paths. In fact, Jesus comments on these paths. In Matthew 7, 13 through 14, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And so Jesus is distinguishing between a narrow path 
and a wide path. And he says there is a world and eternity of difference between the two. And I have come to die on the cross for the sins of the world and rise from the dead and declare to the whole world my paths of righteousness. You cannot earn righteousness. It's been purchased over 30 plus 3 years of Jesus' earthly life. And it's counted to us the moment we believe. It's one of the, the, the miracles, the many miracles that we experience as a Christian. The moment you sincerely and truly repent and trust Jesus Christ, his 33 years of obedience is counted as yours in the judicial tribunal of heaven itself. And he's now leading you in these paths of righteousness. And so when God looks at you, even though you and I are sinners, he looks at us through the lens of Christ's 33 years of obedience to the law, and God sees us as holy and pure as he sees his own son. Oh my, get on your knees at home on soft carpeting tonight and say, God, you see me as righteous as you see your only begotten son. And he says, that's right, because I've credited his righteousness to your account. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They exist. In fact, in Isaiah 35, 8, we read about a highway of holiness. Jesus says in Luke 9, 61 and 62, a person said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. We don't see those kinds of plows anymore, but the idea is when you're holding the, 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 the plow and your cattle are trying to uh, dig a furrow for the seed, if you look back, they're going to stray and go to the left or to the right. It's going to be crooked. Once you've made a commitment to Christ, don't look back or you're not fit for the kingdom of God. He says in Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife who looked back at all the luxuries of this world and she couldn't give them up and she turned into a pillar of salt, says the Bible. I could go on and on with New Testament teaching about the narrow way, the narrow path, and the broad way and the broad path. But keep in mind they exist. And tell your friends and tell your children the paths of God exist and they are the same today as they were yesterday. And they will be the same tomorrow. They have new application for every generation. But the truth of God remains the same. So number one, a doctrinal truth. The paths of righteousness still exist in our generation. And number two, a practical truth. They will be specific in one sense for your life. His paths of righteousness will be unique to your gifts and your calling in life. Your, your paths of righteousness will include mountaintops where you are so full of thanksgiving and joy that you can scarcely contain it. And your paths of righteousness will include valleys that will be so deep and so dark that you don't even want to crawl out of bed in the day. And your paths of righteousness will include opportunities that you never would imagine God would put before you to minister, to serve, and to love, and to give in, in Jesus' name. Children, you can do this even at school. You can love people and serve people and be kind to people and show them what Jesus is like. I want to tell you tonight that Jesus will never trick you. He will never mislead you. He will never deceive you. He is faithful. Ephesians 5.10 says this, try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. That's what this is about. Learn what is pleasing to the Lord as he leads us in paths of, of righteousness. And lastly tonight, We've learned that Jesus is on a journey with us and we are on a journey with him. We've learned that Jesus leads every believer in paths of righteousness. But is there more? Is there something else that sort of encapsulates all of this? There is indeed, and I want to share it with you in our remaining five minutes, and it is this, verse 3. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. For his name, the name that is above all names, the name that we are to hallow, 
You know, the Jews would not even utter Yahweh. They would not even utter the blessed name of God. They were so concerned with dishonoring it. Here we read that, that God is leading your life and my life for his name's sake. What does that mean? I puzzled over that a little bit this week. For his name's sake, for his name's sake. What does that mean? Well, well let me give you these thoughts. First of all, we know that God is reliable, don't we? And so, when he leads us for his name's sake, he leads us in such a way that we will experience his faithfulness, his reliability. God is demonstrating to you and through you to the world that he's faithful. And you wonder why he brings you sometimes into difficulties. You know, he says in Isaiah 43, verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned and the flame will not scorch you, hearkening back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Praise God, he's with us, right? Praise God, the shepherd is there in the midst of those difficult times. But we go through them. You know what the Lord is saying to you tonight? Because I'm going to show you my faithfulness. I'm going to show you how much I love you, and I'm going to walk you through that floody fire. Number two, for his name's sake, God is glorious. And he leads us in paths of righteousness that we might bring him glory. You are good reformed Christians, whether reformed RCA or CRC or some other reformed background. And if you're not from a reformed background, you're welcome here, of course. But you have to know something about us reformers. The glory of God is everything to us. To be a reformed Christian is to see God at the center. The Methodists emphasize conversions. The Baptists order. The Episcopalians have their emphasis. The Pentecostals and the Assemblies of God have their emphasis. The Reformers, since Calvin and Luther, have said, our emphasis is going to be the glory of God. And I love that. That's why I'm a minister in the Reformed tradition. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all what? For the glory of God. For his name's sake. God is seeking, by the way, to enhance his reputation through you. You are a walking reputation of God as a confessing Christian. Thirdly, for his name's sake. You know, God is so good. There's a contemporary song out today that says, you are a good, good father. I see some fathers here tonight, and kids, tonight, before you go to bed, go up to your dad, give him a hug, and say, you are a good, good father, and you remind me of our heavenly father. You're a good dad. You're a good dad. Jesus is leading you in paths of righteousness that he might show you his goodness across the span of your life. And fourthly, His name is beautiful. God is beautiful. And when he says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, I believe it is because Jesus wants us to be a living reflection of the righteousness and the beauty of God. And that prelude dovetailed right into this thought tonight. Beautiful Savior. I tell my wife she's beautiful. And I know you husbands tell your wife the same. And all beauty is a reflection of the source of beauty. All beauty flows from the fountain of beauty. Psalm 27, 4, and we'll draw this to a close now. David is penning another psalm, and he says, 
One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And so we are about beholding the beauty of the Lord. Pastor Ken shared a little while ago about coming to the garden and spending time with the Lord. And there's nothing quite like it in the believer's life and soul. And so we behold the beauty of the Lord, and you know what happens? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. And this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. In other words, both David and Paul are saying, as you behold the majesty and the beauty of God in his forgiving power, in his grace and mercy, in his majesty, in his tenderness, in his strength, as we behold him, we become like Christ. Slowly but surely, with fits and stops and starts along the way, no doubt. But it's happening. It's happening. And so tonight, be encouraged. He is leading you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, God, thank you so much for leading us in this way. We don't always understand your ways with us. But perhaps tonight we have a little more clarity on what you're doing. Thank you, O shepherd. Thank you. We love you. We seek to trust you. All in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our closing hymn is number 461. 461. Let's stand if we are able and sing, He leadeth me.
dear sheep of Jesus Christ, go forth in peace, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.